This is a, a lesson on how you calculate the acceleration which is produced when circular motion takes place. We've already said that if you have an object going in a circle, let's imagine it's going anti-clockwise, that in order for the circular motion to occur, you have to have a force. So if an object was there, then the force would have to be centripetal in towards the center. And it would also be accelerating towards the center as well. Now the question is, if it really is accelerating, how big is that acceleration? Is there a way of working it out? Now we don't have to do the detail of this, but the principles involved we should be able to, to uh, work out. So what I'm going to do is imagine an object is here and I'm going to mark in its instantaneous velocity. Now we've already seen its instantaneous velocity is at a tangent to the orbit. So I'm going to draw it like that and I'm going to call that V1. A bit later on, let's imagine it gets to here and it's new velocity is in that direction. The size of it is the same as before. We'll call that V2. Now, strictly speaking, if we want to work out the acceleration of the object, it's fairly straightforward. The definition of acceleration is the change in velocity divided by time. So strictly speaking, it's V2 uh, minus V1 and you divide that by how long it takes to do it. Another way of writing it would be to say that the acceleration is the change in velocity. I'm going to use the word, the, the letter uh, D delta, the Greek letter, small letter D, for a small change in velocity, and I will divide that by uh, a correspondingly short period of time. And the question is, is it possible to work out this delta V, this V2 minus V1? Well, we know from our module one that it is quite possible to work out uh, how you add vectors together. These are definitely vectors. If, for example, you wanted v2 plus v1, let's do this down here, v2 plus v1, all you would do is to draw v2, which is sort of going um, upwards. Let's draw it there. So there's your v2. And you have to add to that V1, and V1 was heading off sort of to the, the right a little bit. So I'll do that there. And there's V1. And all you do is, with your vector diagram, there's the beginning of your construction. There's the end of your construction. You draw your line from the beginning of your diagram to the end. There it is there. I'll put two arrows on it. And that would be v2 plus v1. Now we don't want that. What we want, going back to here, is v2 minus v1. Well, let's do the negative version of v1. We'll draw v2 as before. Now v2 is sort of heading up in this direction here. There it is. So that would be the positive version of v2 and then instead of going up to the right which is where v1 is going we can draw a negative version of v1 by going in exactly the opposite direction which of course is that way so if you draw your vector in the opposite direction that is the negative version of it and it turns out that if you go from the beginning of your diagram to the end of your diagram that will give you that arrow there, that will give you the overall vector, which is V2 minus V1. And you can see that it's a line that you could measure, you could calculate it, and um, it is a very uh, calculable thing to do. Now, strictly speaking, if you want to work out the acceleration at that point there, then you should look at the first velocity and then allow the object to change its velocity by an infinitely small amount. 
Now, in mathematics, if you've got a change in something which you've written as delta v, then you really should make that infinitely small, and that would become then dv. So the letter D represents something infinitely small, and you divide that by an infinitely small length of time, which is dt. And there's the familiar calculus way of saying what acceleration is. Of course, it's worth saying that a change in velocity which is infinitely small, or a change in time which is infinitely small, actually doesn't exist. Because if I said to you, ah, yes, this uh, infinitely small length of time is, and then I tell you how long it is, you could say, uh, well, couldn't you cut that in half? And of course you could. So these are imaginary sort of quantities, but nevertheless, the mathematics works. And when the mathematicians do this sort of thing with these vector diagrams, they actually end up with a very nice, neat formula for the acceleration. It turns out that the acceleration is how fast it's going, i.e. its speed, no direction needed at all, and you square it up. And then you divide by the radius of the circle, v squared divided by r. So that formula there is the result of taking a as dv by dt, the rate of change of velocity, using vector diagrams to do the analysis, carry out the differentiation process, which is what that is, and they end up with that formula. Now, the process of getting that formula you don't need to know, although you do need to know that that is how you subtract vectors. Once you've got your acceleration formula, then the force that's needed to make that acceleration happen is a fairly straightforward thing to write down, because we know that the force um, applied to an object, the resultant force applied to an object, is mass multiplied by the acceleration it experiences. And we have just simply uh, written down v squared over r as being the acceleration. So the force which causes the circular motion, therefore, is m v squared divided by r. This formula for acceleration has to be learnt, and so does the formula for centripetal force.